Okay. All right. Super. So as your hostess, my don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, if you have questions or thoughts or ideas or suggestions, how can I help you? Just send me an email, cindy at cindymcdonald.com. Don't forget, my name is spelled a little differently. It's C-Y-N-D-Y at cindymcdonald.com. And McDonald is the MC version, just like in the hamburgers. And I am going to be launching some online courses and coaching sessions soon. So watch for emails about that. Our Friday forum, the goal is to highlight the past week's news just kind of give you some input, some insight into it, and also provide advising or business tips. So as I mentioned two weeks ago, we didn't have our forum last week, we're moving to two a month, and the goal is, is to have the second Friday focus more on advising, the college counseling side, that aspect, and then the fourth Friday, like today, to focus on the business side. So some of you, that may not be as of much interest as the advising or vice versa. So this gives you an opportunity to pick the Fridays that are gonna be most pertinent to you and to where you're at in your stage of business and your stage of life. If you have other people that are interested that you wanna to invite to join us on these Friday forums, or to participate, you know, listen to the podcast because I turn these all into a podcast that you can listen to. Please feel free to share the links and the registrations. The next one we're going to do is going to be July 9th, and we're going to talk about the college essays. Um, Stephanie brought this up as a great topic, so she and I are going to be talking about this. And I'm going to try and invite somebody from an essay program to come join us. So more details coming on that. Just watch your emails and you'll see. All right. So now let's talk about um, what has happened this last week. And this last week's news, ACT added a lot of more test dates and more schools are going test optional. The NCAA eligibility has been altered. That actually happened a while ago. It's not something we've really talked about, but it is definitely something that's going to impact our students. And the Chronicle of Higher Education has a list of fall college plans. So um, that is definitely something to we're going to delve into a little bit more so let's go into this and so the act i was surprised that they've added a significant number of tests and those of you that are involved in test preparation probably noticed this this is from appleruth.com um, they do an excellent job. They're a well-known, well-respected um, test preparation company based in Georgia. And so they posted this table. So you can see this if you go to www.appleruth.com. And they've added another September date. So they've also added Sunday testing to the ACT, which I thought was very interesting. In the past, Sundays have always been reserved for those who couldn't test on Saturdays because of religious reasons. And basically, ACT has waived that for this next month and or this next testing cycle. So there's a table looking at the testing calendar. So you have September 12th, 13th, 19th. That's a newly added date. SAT has the 26th. We know SAT had added uh, dates in September, but now ACT has added a significant number of ones. They've added two more new dates in October. So now there's gonna be a lot more testing. But the question becomes, are the students gonna be able to come and take those tests at those times? 
I found it interesting to look at the question and answer section of the ACT website, and here's what I found on their section, um, just some of the questions that were being posed. What about the online testing option that was supposed to be offered this fall? They're going to do, it says, we'll begin in the fall of 20, with the September 12, 2020 ACT national test date. So that's the online version. They're actually trying to ramp all of that up. You know, we'll see if, it seems like September might be a little early, but we'll see. The at-home testing was supposed to be offered as well, and now that's been pushed back to the late fall or early winter. Uh, and these are all answers that are directly on the ACT website. So it says ACT will be providing more information. Maybe you've done a webinar or um, something else that has more up-to-date information. Suzanne says, and will the test centers actually be willing to offer testing on those dates? That's an excellent question. I mean, I know with the June 13th, um, Test. How many of you put in the chat? How many of you had students who were going to take the June 13th ACT test and then were notified last minute that their tests were canceled or their sites are canceled? So I'm seeing a lot of yeses in the test section. I mean, in the chat section. And let's see. Um, what about how many of you had students who show up for the test and didn't and were not able to test? Did anybody have students show up? So because Kazuwei says yes, yeah, she had students show up. I know in my area they said that the high school was going to offer the test, but we called an administrator at the high school and they said, no way are we going to offer the test this Saturday. So I think a lot of schools were listed as test centers and some of my students or students um, in the area were given an option to go to a separate testing center, but you know, it was only 140 miles away. They had to go to LA or San Francisco, Palo Alto. So they weren't really given very viable options. Yeah, some student had students show up, turned away. So I'm not real hopeful for this July test for the exact reason, Suzanne, that you mentioned, that the schools have been closed since March. And are they gonna wanna open up even with social distancing, even with all the, you know, temperature checks and all of that, are they going to want to open up to have students come in and test in July? I do know there were successful testing. Um, Apple Ruth talked about they had a lot of students that successfully tested in June, but I think it was much more of a hit or miss type of situation. So we'll see what July brings and what that might look like. And I believe those of you that are international. All right, so let's talk about the colleges and what they're, you know, where, what they're doing was test optional. I went through the list last night of all the colleges that have said they're going to um, defer ACT, SATs. All eight Ivy Leagues have announced deferred ACT, SAT tests. Now, the level of how they deferred them, what that looks like, what that feels like, and what it sounds like is gonna be very different from college to college. But I think it's significant that now all eight Ivy Leagues have announced a deferred ACT or SAT test policy of some sort. I went through the top 25 news um, World Report, the top 25 liberal arts universities, and the top 25 national universities um, listed in those reports, and less than 25 of them are have announced deferred ACT or SAT tests. Now, we expect there'll be more coming up in the next few weeks. I, I expect more schools are going to go in, you know, jump on the bandwagon, but I thought it was significant that eight of the Ivy Leagues have said yes, but other ones have said, um, have not made those decisions yet. So 
There are seven public school systems, including both public school systems here in California, such as the California State University System and the UC and the University of Georgia. So those of you that are in Georgia have heard about that. So Diane says that it was only optional schools are going to go for the class entering fall of 2020. There's no intent to go test optional for a class entering fall of 2021. That's a very good distinction to have. And I think that's important because sometimes we forget that the recruiting for the class of 2020 is not done yet and that they are still opening doors. And if you go to the NACAC list, there's a list of a large number of schools, even more this year than in the past, that are still looking for students for the fall class of 2020. So the University of Georgia system, this only applies to that fall class, not the 2021. So thanks for that, um, you know, clarification. And Michelle says University of Texas, I knew University of Texas, um, Austin had and Texas A&M just went test optional too. So we're going to see more and more of those public schools and that's why I just put down as an example, universe, public, you know, what we typically or sometimes call the public IVs like University of Mid Virginia, University of Washington. I haven't seen any notes about University of Michigan. Has anybody seen anything about the University of Michigan going test optional? That is not something that was on the list yesterday. So if you do, put something in the test chat. So this is from the Harvard website where it tells students to go test optional, that they are going to test optional. But then the question becomes, what are we going to do with that? Test optional or test blind? And they, again, these are quotes directly from the Harvard website. We have not yet determined how high scores might be considered in the admission decision. Low scores or no scores will not disadvantage a student. There's a prior question on the website. It's like, if I have test scores, should I turn them in? And then the, the answer to this is like, well, if you turn them in and you have high scores, that's where they might be considered, where they're just not sure. So they're still seeing a lot of decisions being made on the fly as people go and trying to figure out how they're going to do this. What about scholarships? We are in the process of identifying the many departments across the campus who may utilize test scores in their business processes. We may want those test scores to give you the physics award or you know, any other kinds of um, considerations. The Office's admission, ad, Office of Admissions is recommending departments do not use test scores for scholarship awarding. We'll update our website as we continue to learn more. So for admission scholarships, they're not required, but for other things, they are going to still probably be considered. So it still becomes a very murky water, what test optional means test most of them are not test blind and so that leaves us where to that question of well should we recommend our students take those tests and i think we are all in good agreement that yes we should still have our students take those tests and use them if their scores are great it's going to benefit them if they're not so great because of all these things like virginia says you know they're going to have to practice taking the test with a mask on, you know, it's hard enough to breathe, let alone concentrate and do all the other things you have to do with a test. So that'll give, at least it'll give students an opportunity to continue and um, have some choices, you know, open some doors. So I think that's a positive thing for them to do. So testing still is a very murky water. Are they gonna be held? If they're held, can people get in? And can they register? I know for a lot of my students, I had a student this last week, she reported she tried to register and the, I believe this was on the ACT. She couldn't get into the September. You know, she had to go with, August, I mean the October test. And so I think a lot of students are going to find their testing is going to be pushed back. 
So because there are so many people trying to test. And that's part of the reason that ACT has added all these added dates. So at least they're looking at what needs to be done and the volume of students that is the press that's going to happen for them. So, um, so April asked, do you know when the UC system will have their own standardized test ready? Is it going to be for the class of 2021? Um, I would be very surprised. I would be shocked if they did it that early. It took them five years to transition from um, the require you know how they handled the essay or the writing portion um, and the subject test it took about five years to basically turn those from a requirement to a recommendation so for the ucs to have their own test ready in a year unless they really put it on fast track i'd be shocked and other when whatever the university of california system does other colleges are going to follow suit. You know, if you when you saw the University of California drop the requirement for SAT subjects, and you saw all these other schools drop them, and now there's only less than a handful of schools that require, and most of them, it's just highly recommended. So, I I expect that we will see a lot of colleges follow suit. Um, I don't know that they're going to go as far as re setting up their own test. I know there's been a lot of comments and suggestions. If we're going test optional, let's just do it. And I think we're going to see more of that as a trend that colleges are going to be test optional. Some of them are announcing for a year. So two years, three years, you know, a lot of them are saying we're going to try this for a trial period of three years. And probably what they're going to find at the end of those three years is let's just keep it. It hasn't affected our recruitment, hasn't affected our numbers, hasn't affected the quality of the students. Steve Cyberson, many of you know, and another colleague did a report, a study on the quality of students that colleges um, have been recruiting in a test optional environment. And they found the quality of students was actually, in some cases, better than those that still use testing. So it's going to be, um, and, and Ellen says she knows the UC plan and she can share. So I'm going to let you talk. Ellen, are you ready? Just give me a heads up, a hands up on here that you're ready. And make sure you guys are putting your notes. I'm seeing these are all to all panelists. Make sure you're putting your chats into all panelists attendees so everybody can see. All right. So, Ellen, are you ready? I'm going to hit the button for you, okay? Okay, Ellen, are you there? Yes, Ellen is here. Okay. Hello. So, tell us what the plan is. Okay. So, the plan for the years 2021 and 2022, the UC is considering itself test optional. What that means is students have the option of submitting ACT, SAT scores. They will not be penalized in the admissions review process for not submitting scores. And students are no longer required to submit the writing sections. That Test scores, is huge. That's huge. That is huge because that's yeah. been such a big part of the UC and what sets it apart from many other schools throughout the country is that the students had to submit the writing. Then that's out of one side of their mouth. Then the other side <laughs> of the mouth is um, test scores may be used for admissions. So because they are holistic review and they consider, and this is out of their mouths, um, anything that you send to us, we consider additive. If it helps you, we will use it in the admissions. If it doesn't help you, we dismiss it. So if you have test scores, those lucky juniors that took it in the spring or last fall, um, admissions, it may be, may be used for scholarships, may be used for course placement for first year, mm -hmm. and may uh, help in the ELC eligibility within the local context admissions guarantee. Right, right. For 2023 and 2024, the UC is going test blind. Oh, interesting. So go all, on. So all, what that means is that all California public and independent high school students have the option to submit, but those scores may not 
be used in making admissions decisions. And, and what the Academic Senate is going to do is work with the university administration on the appropriate approach for non-resident students. So for anybody that's not a California student, I don't have any answers. They don't have those answers yet. Again, test scores may, may be used for, for classes of 2023 and 2024, may be used for scholarships, may be used for course placement, may be used for ELC admissions guarantee. And we should put a side note for anybody that doesn't know, the ELC admissions guarantee is only for UC Merced. Interesting. Yeah, the UC, yeah, the ELC guarantee, I mean, it used to be such a big deal. Students had numbers and, you know, they'd write about I'm ELC eligible. And over the last few years, it's really diminished in the importance that it brings to a, a student's Exactly. Now, to get to the, the one minute, the, the question that somebody said is um, about the UC doing its new test, mm -hmm. there's two options for the class of 2025 and beyond. If, if there is a test that, um, for that the UC has created by the fall of 2020, then all students from California must submit the scores from that new test that new test will be made available to private, independent, and out-of-state schools, and non-residents and international students submit test scores from the new test, or they will follow the appropriate approach as determined by the university. So that hasn't been spelled out, but if the UC does get its act together and the UC creates a test that they are deeming this is what we're gonna do, then it will impact the 2025s. The test will be used for admissions, scholarships, course placement, ELC guarantee. And here's and the other one. you said the fall of 20, they might have the test by when? 2025. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, see, That's that option A. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. It'll take them five it'll, years. It takes, it takes that time. Yeah. If there is no new test, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. Whatever, politics, whatever you want to call it. The UC will eliminate its standardized testing requirements for California freshman admissions. So which do you think it's most likely to happen? I, I, 50, 50 shot. You know, they're all about being the UC and we know what's best for our students and blah, 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 blah. So if there's all this pushback, and this is from Janet Napolitano, who was the head of it, who's now um, retired and moved on, but this was her last act to help the situation. Because when you think about what they're talking about now of test optional, well, that doesn't really help bolster their equity and access, equity right. and access position. Right. And so in this climate, mm, I don't know, you know, do they have people that think that they can put together a test? I don't know. Can anybody put together a test that exactly. hits equity and access? My answer yep. is no, but I'm not a test maker. Um, I think that if the UC eliminates it, it's going to be huge, 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 huge. It yeah. will change this entirely. But that's what I know right now. And for anybody that wants to know, I'm not a UC guru. I just happened to be on their website and got all that info. And it looks like Dale has posted the link because people are asking for that link. And I'll post it in the show notes and the Great. on the website too. So, um, and there are other links um, for some of these. I'll post the Apple Roofs link to their website because they have all the links to all the colleges and their policies. So just as we pointed out in this discussion, there are fine points to it, like the University of Georgia. It's only 2020, the UCs, you know, how are they going to use them? Harvard says, yeah, but you might need them for scholarships. A lot of schools are going to fall under that category as well. But I agree with you. Where the UCs go, the rest of the country follows. That's why all eight of the Ivy League schools now have gone test optional. They don't want to have one that's an outlier, you know, doing something different. Um, than all the other schools and so it's part of not only is it from the educational side but from the marketing and the business side too you know they know they're competing against these different programs so if the UCs drop the writing requirement it's going to go away 
it, it, there will be no reason to keep it because the UCs are really the reason that's keeping it. And it's interesting to see what's happening with the SAT subjects. Still a lot of colleges use it as optional, but it's not as required. Um, you know, well, the UCs, they highly recommend it for some campuses with some majors. Is that going to change or shift if they go test optional? It's going to have to. So, um, so Victoria asks, why does the UC set the trend for the rest of the country? What would you say to that, Ellen? Um, as California goes, so goes the rest of the nation. Yeah. Just a giant, giant, giant generalization. But, you know, if you tra trace it back, at least as far as I've been following with my own children through school, every cut, every, everything, the rest of the states are two years behind us. So for two extra years, schools in Oregon had school nurses. For two extra years, you know, schools in other parts of the country had PE teachers. Not everything, you know, but in general, the way that it has gone is been my, my view that we just we just lead <laughs> yeah for good or for bad <laughs> right we do and university of california another factor is both the ucs and the california state university systems are recognized internationally i mean it, the uc is the most elite public school system in the world and so i think that's part of why it is such a a leader and precursor when they start taking directions um, a lot of people will follow suit because right. not only does it show up here in the state of California and nationally but it shows up internationally too so um, yeah so a lot of you know a lot of different things to yeah and Andrea says UC's also just recently voted to restore affirmative action and there's been a lot of debate about that over the last few weeks and um, yeah. Actually, that's not true. They have okay, not so done it. They have an SB. I don't know the number. Um, it has to go to a vote. Yep. Yep. But then what happens is that the vote happens in um, November, mm -hmm. and then they're still looking at applications after the after the law goes into effect to January. So those January February of the next year, you know, how will that how will that work? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's not it's not law yet. Yeah, yeah, that 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 doesn't surprise me. Yeah, so and Michelle says it's ACA five. It's not a done deal. Asians are protesting against it. So, yeah, there's no easy answers, and um, it is going to be a very interesting time over the next few um, years. Especially, you know, who knows how COVID nineteen, how the pandemic's going to wind up or wind down, and and just all these different things. So with that, let's transition because I want to get to inquiry calls too. And thank you, Ellen, for sharing. I really appreciate it. And um, it's always, that's, I love having everybody's thoughts and participation. So college is planning to open in the fall. So I've been keeping track of this. And I thought it was very interesting because the number of colleges being tracked, and this is through the Chronicle of Higher Education's um, chart that they offer. And I'll put a link into that as well. But it's gone up. The last time it was like 700 coll colleges, universities. Now they're up to a thousand, more than a thousand. And notice the change. So in May, 67%, these are all percentages, said they were planning on in person. 8% said they were planning on hybrid. And then you'll see the other numbers on the screen. 7% were online, 9% said, I'm considering a range of scenarios, and 8% said they're waiting to decide. So overwhelmingly in May, you know, the colleges said, well, we're planning on in-person instruction in the fall. And we know that, you know, they're looking at adjusting dates and when people come and go and all these things. But and the latest chart that was published yesterday um, is just updated a day or two ago that's dropped down to 63% from 67% in person. However, notice the hybrid has doubled. They've gone from 8% to 17%. 
some of these undecided um, schools, some of the ones that were waiting to decide or considering range of scenarios, I think are now dropping into that hybrid. The online stayed about the same. It went from seven to eight percent. Still considering a range of scenarios, that has dropped. They're starting to get their acts together and at least figure out what they might do. Um, that's dropped from 9% to 7%. And waiting to decide, that's also number has dropped considerably from 8% down to 4.5%. So I've added an empty column for July and August, and we'll just keep tracking this to see how the trends are going and what it looks like it might be in the fall. And we know this is so much dependent on, you know, what happens in each state, each community, and, you know, with the coronavirus in general, whether it's going to be safe to go on campus or not. So, the, but for the most part, colleges are planning to open in the fall. What that's going to look like and what that's going to feel like is a whole another story. And so this is actually the chart. So I'm just taking screenshots and keeping them so that you know we can keep track of them over the next couple of months so um so that gives you the and again this powerpoint will be offered on the website so that through slideshare i'll post it to slideshare because we get a lot of um opportunities for other people to see it too so this week's prices who am i going to give the prizes and and the award i'm now calling it the COVID warrior award and who's getting the head in the sand. So I think those online programs is the ones that are going to be the COVID warriors. They're the ones that are taking the, the initiative. They, they understand what the risks are and what the opportunities are. And they're moving forward with planning with online programs. Um, if any of you teach in online programs, I know I teach through the UCLA. Glad to have some of my students with us today. And the UCLA is really, we're getting notes and, and trainings and really focusing on helping faculty and staff to convert to an online approach. You, the problem and the things that our students and that we as advisors, and if you're in any kind of um, online course, I've been talking to, <laughs> people throughout the country. It's like if you take a biology class and all of a sudden, you know, in March and you flip it into an online, well, a lot of times instructors, if they haven't been given the opportunity to plan and prepare, I mean, we, we're gifts, you know, somebody pointed this out the other day, you know, sometimes colleges will give professors a year to line up and set up their courses and get them all ready. And we expected both secondary and post-secondary teachers to do it overnight, well, that's, you can't use the same teaching pedagogy that you use in an in-person format on an online format. So you have to shift the paradigm. And so I see a lot of online programs are trying to help and support students both at the secondary level and at the post-secondary level to try and up their game and do that paradigm shift. And when you've got lesson plans that you've done for 20 years, that's a little tough to do. But my, my uh, COVID warrior for the week goes to those online programs. They are dedicating resources to support online learning. I know many other schools are probably doing this. I see it firsthand through UCLA, and I know other schools are probably working on that, both secondary and post-secondary. But on the other hand, we're going to give the head in the sand award to the colleges, especially those 67% said, yes, we're going to have students on campus. And yes, they're all going to sit in a classroom and socially distance and wear masks. And they're not going to go to bars after class is over or congregate in the cafeterias. They're, they're going to have one-way doors going in and one-way doors going out. And that's going to keep them all safe. I've seen many articles, there was an article in New York Times, and many of you have probably read these articles too, that was like, this is delusional. I mean, there's, you know, um, people are COVID, um, you know, 
exhaustion is setting in, people are tired of being socially isolated. And so you let them loose on a campus, they can't help but you know, congregate together. So um, I don't know, who are they listening to? Are they listening to their board of directors? Um, a lot of it's financial, you know, they can't afford not to have students on campus, they can't afford not to have them in dorms or with meal plans, things like that. Or are they listening to the CDC? So it'll be interesting to hear, you know, what, what your guys, your thoughts are and uh, there'll be lots of conversations over the next few weeks and, and this will all enroll um, throughout the summer as we start getting closer and closer to the fall. And as we mentioned, it really all depends on how the pandemic rolls out, how it happens, what state you're in, you know, are cases going up, going down, staying the same international students going to be able to come in even if they can come in then can they go home you know there's still a lot of travel issues bans and restrictions on so um, so let's see what happens but we still have a lot of people with a head in the sand and I think part of it is understandably economic reasons you know they can't afford to keep their you know keep people off the campus but What's liability then if they bring students on campus and then they get sick? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of issues there. So that's our just a summary of kind of where we're at on the admission news. Um, there's a lot about you know the affirmative action, diversity, equity, how that reflects on the college campuses. If you didn't catch our conversation with Susan Carr a couple of weeks ago, this was just posted as a podcast as well. And Susan put together a great resource for you to use. And I think Susan, she may be on the call. So a shout out to her. Um, but please take advantage of that as well, because those are vital, important issues that are going on on our campuses as well and in our society um, and they'll have we'll see uh, the colleges will reflect that and um, you know it'll be interesting to see how things progress and move forward in the fall too so you know it's it's a little frustrating that we have this COVID going on during this very active political social um, you know, demonstrations, it would be much easier if we didn't have that complication. But, you know, we're all resilient and um, we'll be moving forward with that. So let's talk about the next topic that I wanted to, to go over on the business side, and that's nailing the inquiry call. So how many of you, I'm gonna launch a poll and let's see, I've got about 20 minutes left and I'm going to launch this poll. So you should be seeing it. How much time do you typically, those of you that have your own practice, um, your own business, how much time do you typically spend on inquiry call? And is it 10 minutes or less? 11 to 20 minutes? 21 to 45 minutes? 60 minutes or more. I don't know. I don't keep track. That's what I did in the very beginning. It was like, I don't know. I just talk to people. So let's see what your thoughts are. So we're coming in with some numbers. And then we have the second question, too. And what do you cover in an inquiry call? And we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Do you cover college admissions, everything in college admissions, a little bit about college admissions, everything about my services, or a little bit about my services? So we've got about 62%. So if you haven't answered, please take a moment and think about it. You may not need to know what it is exactly, 
Wendy says, in the second question, I wanted to choose both a little about emissions and a little about my services. Very, the majority of people spend 21 to 45 minutes. 56% of you said, or 27 said, you spend 21 to 45 minutes in an inquiry call. The next amount of time is that 11 to 20 minutes. 60 minutes more or more, that's 13%. None of you spend more than 60 minutes. I am so proud of you. That is excellent. If you're spending more than 60 minutes on an inquiry call, you are not using your time. And the one person says, I don't know, I don't keep track. I understand that. That's how I was in the very beginning. So 10 minutes or less for people or 8% said so they're able to do that. So everybody's going to want to know what your secret is. And I'm going to share a couple of ideas and have you share through the chat too. So what do you cover in an inquiry call? Do you, what do you try to focus on? Sometimes people try to focus on everything in college admissions. We have a few people there. But the, for the most part, 38% said it was the services. Um, so a little bit about college admissions. Most of you say, say everything about my services and a little bit about my services. So that is what we want to talk about. What should be in an inquiry call and how do you nail it? I'm going to share some ideas and give you a challenge that you can um, report back to me on. So let me go back to sharing my screen. Hopefully you're still seeing the nailing the inquiry call. Are you still seeing my um, PowerPoint, right? Yep. Okay. All right. So how much do you share? That's always the question. Is it all about admissions? Is it all about your services? As someone says a little bit about both and that's always the huge issue, right? Think about, too, about your time. Um, your time is money. And think about how much your time is worth. Even if you're in a school or a nonprofit organization and you're not taking business inquiry calls, you're still answering questions and, and people are still calling or emailing you trying to get a lot of information. Um, so think about the time you spend on emails, phone calls, research, preparation, things like that. So keep in mind that your time is worth money. So what you want to do, the goal of an inquiry call is to identify those client concerns. You know, why are they calling you? You want to be able to answer any concerns, you know, pain points, things that they have in order to help feel them feel comfortable with, you know, going and coming to take the next step to coming to meet you. So you want to answer their burning questions. And the goal of the call is to secure an appointment. Now that's a whole other topic we'll cover another time as an initial consultation. And what that looks like, how much do you charge? Do you charge? Do you not charge? How long is it? Today, I just wanted to bring up the topic of the inquiry call. But that's your goal. Get to that initial consultation, right? So, um, and so managing those phone inquiries, and Virginia, you bring up a good point. She says, what about the time on asking a few key questions about them and their student determined fit for you? Absolutely. That's exactly what you need to do. So managing phone inquiries. It's one of the hardest things. I've been working with business professionals for over 30 years, and I find it's one of the hardest things for advisors to do is to manage these inquiries. And so my advice to you is to set these three goals in your inquiry. And your goal is, here's my challenge, is set, limit the length of inquiry call to 20 minutes or less. Many of you are there but maybe you're at the 45 minutes rather than the 20 and so your goal should be to limit the call to 20 minutes or less and so why what do you gather in that information the most important thing is to do exactly what you said virginia is to gather information tell me about your student what grade they at what school do they go to because that gives you more information if you know what school they're at you probably have other students at that school how did they hear about you did they learn about you from the website a friend 
you know, your Twitter account. So learn about the student and the family as much as you can. And you can get that down into, you know, create a script if you have to. You can get that down into probably about, you know, 10 minutes. And that should be the bulk of what an inquiry call is. And then the second part is to deliver information. But the key is you don't want to deliver everything. You don't want to tell them all about college admissions and you don't even need to tell them all about your services. That's what the initial consultation is. It's really an opportunity to say, yes, I think we could work together. And here, the third point is secure the appointment. If you are not using a calendar system, like uh, you know, a scheduler, you, that's the next thing you should look into because it makes it so much easier to say, here, go to my schedule and you know, set up an appointment. But if you're on the phone with them, you can pull up your calendar and say, oh, how about let's meet next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Yes or no? What time do you have this week? Always give them a finite time frame to go from rather than just saying, well, let's meet sometime. And then that'll not, you know, that'll materialize into forever and ever. But these three goals, and I've got a handout that I'm going to put on our website that gives you inform this, this as you're managing phone inquiries to learn about the family deliver information, but not too much information, and secure the appointment. So that's the goal of the phone inquiry. So you can request that managing phone inquiries, just, you know, it'll be on our website and you'll be able to go there and um, request it or pull it from there. So that's, you know, the goal and the challenge on inquiry calls is to not cover too much, just cover enough to give them a, a sense of who you are and for you to get a sense of who they are as well. And if you try, I'd love to hear back from many of you, if you try this over, because now is now it's summer, I know I'm starting to get inquiry calls, you know, a lot of people are realizing like the shock of COVID-19 is over and so, excuse me, they are going to be calling you. So try and create a script for yourself and set it at 20 minutes and try it out with a friend and see if you can do it. I will guarantee you'll spend more time and you'll, the goal is, is you want to close more clients. And if you take this approach, you're going to close more clients. And so it makes it much easier once you bring them in for initial consultation, even if it's using video chat, Zoom, go to meeting, whatever, it gives you an opportunity to open and take it to that next door. So this is my goal and my challenge. So I see um, Leah says most, or many people say most inquiries are by email these days. And that's a good point. Um, so change phone inquiries to email. You're still, the principle is still the same. You want to gather information. Maybe you have a form, an online form that you have them fill out. That's another reason to look at a calendaring system. Um, I'll take a screenshot of my input form. So my scheduler has questions on it, and many of you probably do this as well, so that when they schedule that initial consultation, I have a certain amount, I've gathered some information and I've been able to deliver information through that scheduling process. And you can do the same through Google Forms or you know, if you have landing pages on your website, things like that. So, um, <clears throat> so, so that's one thing to look at. So many of you, Julie, others are saying, you know, you get most from the website. How do you handle that? You need to create a system or a flow. So when those come in, you can capture them. And the best thing to do is create an automatic campaign so that when you get an inquiry through your website 
or through Facebook or what other channels you have that you create a campaign and they get an automatic email that says here, here's a link to my intake form. Let, tell me a little bit more about you. And here's a link to my calendar and here's how you get a hold of me. And um, when you put those on your websites, like I have an appointment for a brand new student Saturday that she texts me. I mean, sometimes you get texts and said, I need to come see you. Now, this is a parent that I've worked with her oldest several years ago. So we already have a relationship, but I noticed that, oh, there's a, there's a schedule. Her son is scheduled on my calendar for Saturday. I never even had to talk to her on the phone or I, we just exchanged texts. I never even emailed. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, um, and so here's another good point. Um, Lauren says, my process is the same as Michelle's and thanks Michelle for sharing this too. I don't have an initial consultation unless they've seen my pricing. And Michelle, you said, I usually get inquiries via my website or email. Then I set a short call, then send them a fee list. And if they can afford the price, send an appointment to close. That's an excellent, and what you're doing is you're building your funnel and you're driving it down because if people can't afford it, or not interested in committing that funds to it, then you shouldn't be, you should be moving on. And so absolutely creating a, a funnel, a, a process will help you maximize and use your time in a much more productive way. So I see the question is which schedule do I use? The one I use is youcanbookme.com. Um, 10 bucks. It's $10 a month. And it's the best $10 I spend in my whole practice because it saves me so much time in so many ways. There's Calendly, there's Appointment Core, there's many, many types of schedulers out there. And many of them will integrate in with different websites and other systems. Um, if you use CRMs like MailChimp or um, you know, constant contact, things like that. Some of them integrate, but I just use the scheduler and that's all I have. So College Planner Pro has a great scheduling calendaring system. Absolutely. So when you've got it integrated into a system, that that's one less um, extra resource that you have to have. And so Acuity, that's another one. So, and Calendly is a black owned business. I did not know that. A pointlet. So there are just so many different tools and resources. So love these thoughts and ideas. Um, this is why we we come together. We can teach each other. So let me go to the next one. There we go. Whoops. Um, so I am going to watch your email. I am going to do a webinar on the top five mindset mistakes entrepreneurs make. So this is going to be a specific webinar. I've worked on this. I've done this presentation um, in different ways at different conferences, but really looking at mindset and what we need is mindset as females, males, entrepreneurs, educators, you know, what are the mindsets that we need to have? So I'm going to be offering that sometime in July. And of course, this session is going to is recorded. That's why I repeat things so that you those of you that are listening can at least get an understanding of what is on the screen and we'll have the presentation and I will post these available resources. So let me I'm going to end this um, presentation. I have this love hate relationship with the whole PowerPoint on Zoom because it's not very um, user friendly. And let's see. All right. And of course, my internet is not as speedy as. Um, okay. So we are right at almost at the top of the hour. There we go. And I want to thank everybody for being here today. I hope that um, being solo, this has been my, one of my first ones being solo. I really appreciate your input, your thoughts, your expertise. 
I'm not the one with all the expertise. I don't know all the answers. I never propose that I do, but if I can bring things together, like make sense of it and bring calm out of this chaos, that is my, my goal. So you guys, I'll see you in two weeks. We're gonna talk about essays. We'll still cover the news, so college news. And if there are things come up that you want us to cover, you know, please send that to me. And I love talking with other consultants. So, you know, if you want to participate, just let me know. I'm gonna be scheduling these clear out through the summer. So please take care and please re be safe you know, stay healthy and, you know, support each other because we all do that. And I just want to also, again, thank everybody for supporting me. I'm still navigating these waters. I don't really like the whole title of widow at this point, but um, I'm still trying to figure out what my new role and my new purpose is going to be in life. And I appreciate all your guys' help in figuring that out. So talk to you again later and see you in two weeks.